Uh, I think we are ready to start. I'm uh, glad to welcome you to this debate. We are uh, joined uh, in this debate by some members of the public. This is the closing debate of a very intense today's conference on a comparative approach to outcome-based commissioning and how can we improve outcome, especially for people that are the most vulnerable in society. And we look at the approaches uh, that try to merge the role of the public sector and the private sector, in particular with tools like social impact bond or other social outcome contracts. And uh, we thought that this was a very interesting uh, opportunity to extend the invite to members and uh, from outside to welcome you to this uh, community of thinkers that are trying to uh, improve how we organize our public uh, services. Just uh, to give two words of introduction with the intent of this session. The whole conference has been about bringing together the perspective of practitioners that are out there at the core phase trying to tackle difficult problem with a more reflective attitude of academics that stand back and look and reflect what have we learned from past experience. And uh, those are two different uh, ways of looking at the same problem. And we think it's important that we find a space and time to talk to each other and to listen to each other even though we put very different lenses on problems, we might have different sets of value, different perspective, different time horizon, uh, but listening to each other will help us solving problems in society more successfully. This is our hope at the Government Outcome Lab. So this debate uh, tries to represent and give you a flavor of the discussion we had today. And uh, we decided to invite a very distinguished uh, representative of these two camps. So on, uh, on my left, I have uh, Toby Eccles, who is a passionate practitioner. He is uh, the founder of Social Finance, that is a very important intermediary in the space of social impact bonds. So those are ways for the nonprofit and private sector to interact with the public sector through contracting, in in involving impact investors, so new scheme for the public sector to engage with assets in society to tackle complex social issues. And uh, Toby is really passionate about the role of these tools and how non-government uh, agents can really make a difference. And on my right, I have uh, Professor Mildred Warner from Cornell University. She has uh, more years than she wants to admit to uh, of experience in looking at how we reform uh, public services. She's an accomplished academic, and uh, she has spent her life reflecting on how the go government organizes public services, how we reform them, what is the role of the private sector. Uh, we have been seeing from the creation of the welfare state changes, like trends in uh, services provided by the state, and then we have this hollowing out. So we see that more and more there is an outsourcing, so a reliance of the public sector to do the provision and the government to maintain a role of uh, uh, organizing regulation but not being engaged in delivery. And uh, Mildred and colleagues uh, like Mildred have been looking at these trends, what have we learned, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what's happening. And uh, she's a passionate believer in looking at evidence, and she's an empirical researcher, so she really looks at, there are all these claims, what happens, uh, in practice, can we step back and reflect? So I ask them to bring their perspective and uh, to reflect on how, what is the role of uh, the private sector and markets and what is the role of government? What brings us together is we want to improve social outcomes, uh, but we see different ways of getting there. So the way we are structuring the debate tonight is that First, I will give a word to Toby, who has 12 minutes exactly to uh, outline his argument and persuade you of the fundamental role of non-government actors to lead uh, how we improve uh, uh, services. After that, I'm giving 12 minutes to Mildred to respond, reflect, and uh, uh, challenge his views and persuade you that uh, uh, she has uh, evidence to bear to, for, to shape your opinion. Then I'll give five minutes exactly to Toby to react, five minutes to Miller to react, and then I'll hand over to you. And uh, we will uh, finish no later than 6.30, where uh, everybody's invited to a drink reception. 
And I want to remind everybody that we are live streamed. And uh, so behave. <laughs> <laughs> we have a time machine ready to start when Toby is ready. Thank you very much. A time machine. I've lived through a time machine for a long time. A clock. It's okay. been a long day. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, right. I have to say, making markets in social welfare, I couldn't thought of a better way of making it sound less attractive. Um, and so then I'm, I'm proposing it, so that's slightly awkward. Uh, but so, so th firstly, thank you, Mara, for that, that framing. Um, I, will, I will now endeavour to do so. So... The first thought here is that this is about using non-state actors to provide services. And the starting point would have to be, we all do this an awful lot, folks. Um, you know, 15% of global GDP, according to Apolitical, which has an entity I don't know enough about, but they are somewhat researched, you know, is on government procurement. Now, that, I'm sure, includes you know, defence contracting and lots of other things. But we see enormous amounts of social services that are contracted in various different ways. Um, and when I look at uh, this, I'm therefore much more interested not in whether one contracts services, but in how one goes about it and how to improve it. Because what we've seen, whether they're contracted services or government services, is that very often you find one-size-fits-all, um, input-driven, process-driven services which don't actually listen to and understand the needs of the user and the needs of the vulnerable that they're meant to be supporting. They come from one particular angle, education, housing, unemployment, or similar, when actually, at the moment in our societies, most of the people who've got real vulnerability have got multiple and complex needs, and therefore, each of these services are actually pretty poorly designed for them. So our interest in starting this journey towards social impact bonds and generating and working with outcomes was really because we saw that those services were not working for people and wanted to do something about it. Are social impact bonds the whole answer? Absolutely not. Are they a starting point for trying to create change? Yes, an incremental step rather than the end of the journey. And that's, I think, a little bit more what I want to talk about throughout today. The other thing I just wanted to mention, because it will also come up, is it's not just about using the private or non-state actors for provision, but it's also about using non-state finance, private finance, in all of these pieces. And so I'll talk a bit about that. But again, it's extremely widely used. And so again, in my view, the essential problem is how does one use it effectively, rather than whether, does one, whether one uses it at all. Um, I think... In thinking through this, I've just sort of talked about some of the concerns we've got in terms of public provision. I think there's another element which I'd just like to go into, and that is that the longer term, what trends are we seeing at the moment? I think one trend that we'd like to see, or a number of people are interested in, is how do we help public services move from only acting after the damage has been done, uh, rather than trying to avoid the damage happening in the first place? So we're good at prisons, we've got a national sickness service that's very good at dealing with things once it's gone wrong, but if you look at um, the National Health Service, I think it's something like it's either 94 or 96, I'm afraid I can't remember which way around, I apologise, percent of spend is on the acute, and somewhere between 4 and 6 percent is on prevention. So if you look at that, you're seeing something which is massively skewed one way. So... We're interested in prevention. We're interested in services that learn and adapt. Most of contracting at the moment is built around an idea that the contract is specified by the public sector very carefully. Um, and then provided to someone for, say, three years or something similar. And they're then meant to be providing the services accordingly. Um, and the f that second and third year is set out in the first year before you sign the contract. And you have bid according to that contract specification. So in other words, that contract says in, in invisible ink all over it, please do not learn whilst providing this service. Because learning would be really awkward, because then you'd want to change something. And please don't do that, because the whole point is we've specified what the service is at the beginning. And if you come back and say you want to change something, that's downright awkward. We can't do that, sorry. Uh, because otherwise I'd have to admit failure upstream, and that gets terribly difficult, so please, please don't learn.
So that's, again, in other words, you're meant to learn after the contract is gone, and then we'll publish an evaluation after the contract is finished, which hopefully someone might read before they contract the next one, but then again, they may not have done. So that idea of adaptation and improvement all the way along isn't there. I'll just, um, so that's my sort of concerns that we were trying to solve. Uh, outcome contracting seems to have done some of that. It does seem to have enabled some quite significant levels of adaptation in contracts when people have been running them, and service providers and individuals providing those services, not all of them, but quite a lot, when talking to them, have found that they've really been able to reconnect the service with the people that are using it. And that, I think, is extremely valuable and exciting. Are they all working perfectly? Because there's a lot of learning around what outcome measures and everything else are right. So I'm going to now address a few of the classical criticisms of impact bonds, and then I want to talk a little bit about what I see might be a, a better future, if you like. Where are we going next? Um, so the first one, I think, is around the role of the investor in a, final, in a social impact bond. That we have got, if you like, a contract where you say, you're going to get paid on the outcomes you deliver. That gives you much greater flexibility to try and improve and adapt the service you're providing. But you're not getting paid until you've delivered some outcomes. Because you're not paid until you deliver some outcomes, someone needs to pay for your service in the meantime. Ooh, you need an investor to pay for it in the intervening period. Who is this? You know, is this a dastardly, uh, typically white male in red um, braces with a pinstripe suit on coming in to take over public services and dictate how they are happening. And I think in the majority of instances, the answer to that seems to be no. Um, I'm reasonably glad to say. So I do think that there is a concern about the, 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 the role of investors. I think that there is a theory of change in impact investment that is significantly different from the theory of change in social impact bonds. That theory of change is if we build enough impactful um, contracts and investment opportunities, that generate a market rate return, we can demonstrate that you can have impact and a market rate of return at the same time. And that means there will be all that money from the financial markets available to come and make change happen. And that will be amazing. And that will be awesome. And that will change the world. Um, the difficulty is they then make the service that one's looking at and the investment proposition a slave to that theory of change. That actually we need to focus this on the needs of the capital rather than the needs of the service. I think it's far too early, in my view, to do that. The theory of change in social impact bonds is that we are trying to help change and realign so as to increase the available, the, the amount of adaptation happening in services, to increase the focus on service users, to increase their ability to change, rather than to pri provide some kind of vehicle for longer term capital market engagement. Maybe. In a long time, that might be the case, but I wouldn't put that at the centre of, of the argument at the moment. Um, I'm sure other things will come up in, in, in Mildred's piece, so I won't go through all of the other criticisms at the moment, because um, I'll have the chance in my five minutes, and I've got four minutes left. So um, let's instead go straight to... So I'm relying on you, Mildred. Please be as critical as you can be. Uh, I, think, I think you're reliable on that, so we're all right. Um, so the, the next piece here really is what could one look at that's different? Because when I look at the relationships between public sector and private sector and the contracts that are developed, the first thing you see is this extraordinary low level of trust on both sides. And so we have basically an environment where government tries to dictate exactly what it looks like because they don't trust these guys over here. And the private sector people find the government equally confusing and liable to change, and policy will change, and suddenly people will be really enthusiastic about the private sector, and then the next lot will come in and they'll be terribly in earnest and nervous about the private sector. So it's a very difficult environment to work in. Um, but government is the primary revenue in a lot of the markets it's creating. It has the opportunity to make markets, not just react. And that means it can set what is the definition of success of that marketplace? It can work out what are the rules for entry? What are the rules for exit? What are the rules for participation? What is the price discovery mechanism in your market? How does that go about working? What are the circumstances when that price can change? How often does it change? All of these are rules which the government has available to them to make for a functioning public service market in whatever it's trying to do. And because it doesn't think of itself as a market maker, 
it doesn't set any of those rules. So instead, it sets up the engagement that the rule of success is can you write a really good procurement bid? And can you have as low price as possible? So if you've got bid, bidding ability as your definition of success in your marketplace, that is not very well correlated with the effectiveness of your services. So that is why we're interested in outcomes as a starting point, because it changes the definition of success in the marketplace. But there's lots of other ways of thinking about that. That outcome could just be data transparency. So you could create a market for um, cataract operations providers, just picking something fairly random. And you could say, OK, we're going to have um, uh, time to wait. We're going to have uh, numbers, a proportion that have complications, and we're going to have patient satisfaction. And we are going to transparently uh, present those for all providers in this marketplace. You'll be regulated. There are certain conditions that you have to meet. And if you fail to meet them, you won't be able to participate until you do. Um, and we will allow patients to choose according to how long they'll have to wait, what other people have said about them, and whether they deal with the relevant sets of complications. Just as an example, that would be a very different way of engaging with the private sector. I'll talk more about that later, because I've only got 55 seconds, and I'm very aware of uh, what's going to happen at that point. <laughs> OK? So um, why don't we have markets like that at the moment? My view is that at the moment, the interface is run by an entity or a thing called procurement. And that interaction with procurement, the procurement guys in government, and I've met plenty of them, and they're great, but their model of accountability their accountability structure is that they run a good process and the council doesn't get sued. There's no accountability towards the quality of the service that's being delivered. So that is one area that we can look at. I also think sometimes that government's more focused on cost than outcomes. So I put it to you, we always work between government and the private sector. This is normal. We need to improve the quality of that relationship rather than ditch it. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, all right. So this is my turn, <laughs> I guess. I'm going to stay seated because I actually put my notes on the computer and I can read them better if I'm sitting close. But I, first, I want to thank the, the, out, the Go Lab for inviting us. And it's been a fantastic conference. Thanks to all of you for the great input over the last two days. I've learned a lot, and I look forward to sharing some thoughts here now on this debate with Toby. Um, I found the question, making markets in the welfare system, a very curious question. Because by definition, public services arise from market failures. So how far can you use markets in reforming social services? So what can I contribute to this debate? I'm not an expert on SIBs, but I have spent the last 30 years, gray hair, uh, studying contracting in the local government sector around the world with a special focus on the US, which is a place which is very enthusiastic about market delivery possibilities. So if there were ever a place that was a good place to try market approaches, the US might be a good one, because we like markets. Um, so, if, uh, so what's been our experience with contracting? And a lot of the contracting has been in really basic services that ought to be relatively easy to do. Water, public water service delivery, garbage collection. There have probably been the most studies, actually, in those two sectors, water and garbage. And what we find is that there's concerns with lower quality. Um, there's a lot of strong economic theory that says when private actors are engaged in uh, service delivery, they're going to have an incentive to save cost to increase profits. And so if you don't have a very close monitoring system, you'll get quality erosion. There's also economic theory that suggests that cost savings are going to come from largely from competitive pressures in the marketplace, but we find almost no competition in public sector markets. In fact, we now call them quasi-markets. And in fact, the word used here at this conference was um, monopsony. 
So in the situation, an oligopsony probably would have been a better word. So the, the fact that you don't have a lot of competition in the system has caused us, we did a meta-regression of every study ever published on water distribution and garbage collection and found no statistical support for lower cost with private delivery. I've also done nationwide surveys of local governments asking them, how many alternative providers do you have for a list of 67 different services that local governments provide? And it's less than two on average. Does two equal a market? No, I don't think so. So what's happening, then, then there's been this whole host of theory around transaction cost and a recognition of the fact that the design of the contract, the monitoring of the contract, the concern about principal agent problems and preference alignment between public preference and private preference actually contributes to the cost. And um, so what we're seeing as a result now is reversals in privatization around the world. In U.S., the privatization trends have been flat. They peaked back in 1997, according to the surveys we do every five years. Uh, in the private sector, we're seeing increased attention given to insourcing instead of outsourcing. And the reasons that are given by Deloitte and Touche in a study that looked at Fortune 500 companies was the concern about loss of internal control loss of intelligence about the service and how it's organized, and then concerns about fail-safe delivery. Because with certain services, particularly typically in the public sector, you must ensure that the service happens. And if something happens and you have a failed contract, you've got to be right in there with an alternative very quickly. So can SIBs improve on this performance that we've seen with um, straight up relatively easy contracting? Um, and so let's go back through those same things. Cost savings. Well, actually, at this conference, we've been talking about that SIBs are more expensive in the short term. They have the promise of possibly reducing cost in the long term, but in the short term, it's a more expensive contracting mechanism. Competition. It's been pretty clear throughout the conference that there's no competition. It's, it's basically a network. It's a governance network of a provider, maybe one or two, a commissioner, one, and an investor, one or two, maybe three, if you can find them. So, and then there's been discussion throughout the conference of the very high transaction cost, um, especially for the providers, it seems, because you've now added this layer of information and, and data, data and evaluation, which is definitely a, a benefit because we now know something, but it also takes a lot of time. So the... The concern I have is that these metrics may lead to a narrowing when the goal was to broaden. So can the outcome focus really broaden the nature of the intervention? Because I think that's the dream of the SIB. And I, I'm going to suggest that that is fundamentally at odds with the financialized performance metrics that are also at the core of the SIB model. I don't think you can have it both ways. If you want broad outcome focus, then I think SIB designers should jettison their enthusiasm for market discipline and monetize metrics, as I think these necessarily narrow the intervention and they extinguish citizen and client voice, substituting evaluators and financiers as the primary voices in the system. Um, a number of presentations over the last two days have suggested that we need to separate or drop out the financial model and metrics and focus more on the relational challenges of network governance for cross-boundary and longer-term coordination. Mara asked me to build my remarks from a paper I wrote back in 2007 in Policy and Society that was looking at contracting trends over the last 20 years. And I argue there that we need a balanced approach. Technical planning, market engagement, and democratic accountability and engagement. Now, SIBs have technical planning. That, I mean, they are, these things are very technical, and y'all are really expert on it. And they have market engagement from the investor. But where is the democratic accountability and engagement? I have not seen any discussion in this conference about SIBs directly involving citizen or client voice. Technical planning, I think that's what SIBs are about designed by experts without public input, using market forms of evaluation to drive investment, and that's a concern. So the promise of SIBs, like Toby has outlined, is really visionary. New ways of commissioning, outcomes that give us real change, new funding streams for a state that's facing austerity. That's really super exciting. 
But then there's the reality of SIBs. The serious challenge is confirmed by practitioners and academics alike at this conference. You can't escape the fact that the fundamental design, external finance based on pay for success, shifts the power outside the system. I'm going to argue that government service delivery is as much about process as it is about outcome. Most of us believe in democracy, which is about process, not efficiency. Um, so while privatization in promise to actually increase client voice in a marketplace, consumer voice, consumer sovereignty, but actually kind of failed to deliver on that promise, SIBs don't even pretend to increase client choice or voice. I think they're fundamentally paternalistic, and they give the primacy to external evaluators and financiers. The idea that clients and frontline service providers would be empowered to re-engineer the system and focus on outcomes is a wonderful dream, but I think it's undermined by the financing and evaluation model. You need to decide what you want. If you want a robust participatory process that empowers those directly involved, then that's what the piece that we should be working on. Or if you want a privileged financial interest in third-party evaluation firms and investors, you can go that way. We have a lot of experience with participatory regimes, co-production, participatory budgeting, comprehensive neighborhood initiatives, but SIBs don't do that. So if we look historically at trends in public sector reforms, think back to new public management. It focused on articulating the needs up and down the system from clients to all the layers in the, in the bureaucracy all the way up to the provisioner. But SIBs bring in powerful external actors to drive the system, potentially stripping voice from the internal teams and clients. Then we moved on to network governance, which tries to articulate the needs of all parties in the provider system. But SIBs centralize power in the evaluator and the intermediary, giving predominance to the interest of the financial metrics. The work on network governance and public administration has recognized the need for a strong civic core, but SIBs think that core can be marketized forms of evaluation. Then we have new public service which comes in that says, can we bring the citizen back center stage? But SIBs put money center stage. So I think these features undermine the ability of SIBs to achieve their vision. I don't think SIBs represent a balanced approach to public sector reform that has market elements, technical planning elements, and democratic accountability elements. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. If SIBs were more targeted on reforming strong private actors in the market, I think they could have a role. So let's go back to the key question for this debate. Should we make markets for the welfare system? I'm not convinced that we should. Old conceptions of public service were based on notions of universality, public provision, control via democratic and bureaucratic means. SIBs fragment and target services, substitute evaluation and financial metrics for accountability, create a small network of actors, evaluators, intermediaries, providers, investors. That's the SIB ecosystem. This is not a market and there's no downward accountability to the citizen or the client. So is there a role for markets in social services? Yes, I believe there is. And I believe it is in reducing root causes, true prevention. I would like to see SIBs focus more on strong actors in service fields where market mechanisms may be more appropriate. And these better functioning private market sectors would then reduce the root causes of social problems and thus reduce demand on social supports. Is prevention only a public sector responsibility? What about the role of the private sector in prevention? Could SIBs motivate private sector actors to focus more on sustainable economic and social outcomes of their own practice in banking, in housing, in wages and employment conditions? This might be the most appropriate target for SIBs, and the payer would be the private actor who would benefit from a better functioning market on both the supply and demand side. We could retarget FIBs, FIBs, SIBs away from poor and marginalized clients and their providers, and instead focus market discipline on the strong private market actors, and they could then contribute to real social investment. Thank you.
Toby, you have uh, five Ooh. minutes to react. I know you can think very quickly on your feet. Excellent. The baton returns. Hmm. Okay. So, lots and lots of really important pieces there, actually. And some of these are, are criticisms and concerns that I share. Um, I think the main one that I've been concerned about, certainly over the last 12 months, has been how do we really make sure the service user gets at the center of service design? And how do we reduce the potential for patriarchy, paternalism, um, and the fact that we have essentially relatively entitled people designing services for vulnerable people? And that's a pretty wide problem. I think that happens a lot in public services, and I'm very close to a number of people who've commissioned services, and I know how they've um, they're meant to be engaging service users in how they redesign services much more carefully than generally takes place. Um, and the lack of measurement of any form of success of those services and the constant driving down of cost as they get recommissioned or even if they're sustained within the public sector. And therefore the focus on, you know, if you look for example at what a probation officer uh, does with a prisoner, um, it's certainly in the UK, how that has become extraordinarily bureaucratized and utterly useless from everybody's point of view. How anyone can sustain doing that, I'm afraid I'm somewhat lost and I feel very impressed that people do sustain themselves in those roles. But, so I think the, the problem that you bring out there is a very important one and one that I I'm fully agree with, but I'm not so sure that either it's done marvelously better in the public sector or that uh, if we were to bring in red in tooth and claw financially oriented investors the whole time into social impact bonds, I would, I would gain a similar concern. But for example, to take one which would be at the extreme end of, of the vulnerable spectrum and of the concerns that you would have, we were looking at we're trying to get a social impact bond going um, to get proper health care for um, going for sex workers in Johannesburg and Pretoria. Um, an area where HIV rates were around between 57 and 75 percent, depending on which part, one of those horrific statistics I've met working in social finance. And there it was absolutely vital that we had, there was a whole rights focus, there was a whole gender focus, there was an enormous focus on making sure that there was the right engagement of, of sex workers in the process of developing that service. The reason it wasn't there was because sex work is illegal, providing health care that actually fitted the needs of sex workers was not happening on the state provision at all. Um, and we could only get the state to engage on an outcome basis. So I think the value that should be added here is that sometimes the outcome basis is the way of engaging the public sector at all in the provision of a service that is not wanted otherwise. And that's been, you know, we've been trying to change government by saying, hey, if you don't want to provide services for short sentence offenders when they come out of prison, if you're comfortable with the fact that they've spent seven or eight previous incarcerations, that they've done 45 previous offences, uh, and you put them out with 42 pounds in their pocket and you say they've got six weeks before their benefits kick in, we think that something else should happen. And on that basis, we're happy to take a contract where you only pay if it makes a difference, any interest. That's a pretty powerful conversation to have. And that did break things open, and it did change the nature of the conversation. We then have to be very careful, having put that in place, that we do not financialize the service provision. And so I completely agree with you that the concerns around moving actors so that they're only concerned with whether they're going to get paid or not, you lose all the intrinsic benefit of, of you know, you lose all intrinsic motivation and everything else. That's not what we're looking for, and that's not all we got. Um, we had 14 foundations and charities investing in the, in the Peterborough Social Impact Bond, so they were very focused. So I'm, I agree that your concern is they get to scale. How do we sustain that? Can we have, are there such things as investment actors that care passionately about social change? My view is that's growing. Um, and one of the difficulties is they then get advised by people from the pure traditional financial sector who tend to return to their previous crimes and misdemeanors, because that's the normal way of working. They don't mean to, they just did. Um, uh, and so I think that's another piece. And I, the last bit I'd add on this is that the, 
normal contracting method, going around on inputs and processes and every time trying to make those inputs and processes cheaper because you're not measuring any outcomes or value outside of that is, I think, one of the pernicious things that we've got at the moment in public sector provision, um, both in terms of internal public sector provision and in terms of external service provision. Um, does capturing some basic outcomes solve that problem? I think it's a starting point. And I'm hoping that the greater data capture that we see from these elements grows the need for data and transparency and creates momentum. Because it's very hard to say, oh, no, we need to go back to the point where we knew nothing. And in fact, I think the, the drive for data and the fact that it becomes cheaper and easier to capture data will continue to push things in that direction. Thank I'll you. stop there. Bit, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, you have uh, five minutes and 30 seconds. Oh, oh, she's very much keeping things equal. So I want to go back to the first set of comments you made, Toby, where you talked about problems of low trust on both sides, that government as the primary revenue supplier, the payer, um, needs to be able to make markets and the rules that govern the system. And I just want to suggest that in different political context around the world, the ability of government to make markets is vastly different. We were having that discussion in coffee beforehand. And the notion that government should make markets is something that actually doesn't land very well in my context of the US. We know from a sociological perspective that government does make markets, but we pretend that they don't and that there's some kind of free market out there. And so the ability to make rules for entry and exit, rules for, as you said, price discovery mechanism is more constrained in some environments than others because of the welfare conventions and the market conventions, the varieties of capitalism we see around the world. The second issue was the issue of low trust on both sides. In public administration, we've done a lot of work on relational contracting. Because transaction costs are so high, there have been efforts to get away from the contract and move to more relational, flexible, responsive pieces. And that often, it will lower transaction costs, it'll also raise corruption. And so you do need to think about that and you really need to think about the power in the system and where does the power lie to call it when you see it. And the provider is the low power one in the system if, to, depending on how far away government is in the SIB system, it may not have, some, some SIB advocates recommend that government sort of like get totally out of the way. I think government should be right there in the center myself. And the intermediary and the evaluator have a lot of outsized power in the system. And then the financier has the power to walk away. We heard the story of, of Goldman Sachs walking away early on Rikers Island because um, Bloomberg was going to hold them up with their guarantee. So power is something we need to pay a lot more attention to and not be naive about power differentials. When it comes to outcomes, I mean, I totally agree with you. We want outcomes and we want better outcomes. And if you can have a revolutionary new way of thinking about it as prevention is cheaper than cure, so let's put more money on the front end on prevention. I mean, this, this is definitely something we, we, we do want to do. But why do we have to link that to a payback mechanism that runs the risk of taking you right to financialization, which is where you don't want to go. Why can't government enjoy those savings? Why do they have to be given away? And this is where, when, when Alison and I were working on our paper, we started thinking about why don't we create SIBs for the rich, SIBs for powerful market actors? If this is such a powerful concept of outcome-based, um, why can't we get our real estate sector to reform and build a housing people can afford to live in? We've got a global housing crisis. The real estate developer market is broken. It's filled with market failure. And if you built more housing that people could afford, people would be housed and we would have less of a homeless problem. Why can't we use SIBs for that? Because they're, they're market already market focused. Why can't we take this camera that's focusing on outcomes and direct it toward private market actors rather than social service providers and cash-strapped governments? Same way with bankers. How many of your, how, what percentage of your population is unbanked? And they go to usurious 
lenders? Why aren't bankers leading the process for banking reform to make sure that banking services are made available to everyone at reasonable and not usurious rates? They would benefit because then more people would be bringing their money to banks, society, you know, society grows, they grow. Same way with employers. Families are under horrendous stress. We don't have living wages anymore. Firms have been pushing, driving down wages. They've been pushing the flexibility onto the worker. This has raised family stress. We were hearing stories about foster care being higher than ever. This is, where did these social ills come from? Yes, yeah, some of it comes from the opioid addict, um, op from drug abuse and things like that, but some of it comes from a restructuring of the market since the 1970s away from conditions of labor that enable you to both work and take care of your family. So why don't we use SIBs to get market actors to look at their own practice rather than just looking at government as, oh, I can make some money by reducing government's cost in the long term. I think that's where the model is like, if it's good for them, if it's good for, I mean, if it's good for the public sector, why isn't it good for the private sector? Thank you. So we have uh, micro microphones. How many? We have one, two. We have two microphones, and I'm taking a group of, of questions together. So, any question ready? We have uh, one in the front. I'm, I'm interested to uh, ask Mildred if she could just tell us a bit more about, give, give us an example of a SIB that might operate in the private sector. How exactly would it work? If you can just give us an example, please. Any other question? Hi, Jonathan Flory. I'm, I confess I'm a colleague of Toby's, but uh, don't worry, I don't always agree with him. <laughs> um, if, I'm, if I'm allowed a, a comment and then a question, my comment would be there's a very important debate about government money um, partnering or not with private investment capital. I think there's an equally important debate about government money partnering with private philanthropy in a way that neither feels captured by the other just sort of park that. Um, my, my question is really that this, this important idea of the participatory nature of program design, and my question is about sequence, surely that happens before the spending decision, whether it be in-house, outsourced, SIB or not. Surely, the, surely you can get that participatory element sort of in early, if you like, before you press the button on spend. One last question at the back. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Eleanor Carter. I work at the Government Outcomes Lab with Mara. Um, I'm really interested about the, the transatlantic nature of this debate and the degree to which welfare context might be an important part of shaping each of your perspectives. So could, perhaps you could reflect on that. Thank you. Okay, let's start with those. Um, SIBs for the private sector. Can you articulate how you would design one, Mildred? Boy, you know, you guys spend years designing these things, and you want me to design one with, uh, with no notice and, and two seconds? Uh, we were talking about this, actually, on the, on the first day in the Q&A it came up. So in the United States, we don't have paid, we don't have government law that requires firms to pay for sick leave or parental leave. That's an option and many firms choose not to provide that to families. Some firms do provide it. I work for a, uh, an employer that provides it. And the research shows that that leads to um, more um, stability. You, you have less churn of your workers, that it leads to greater loyalty and commitment to the firm, which translates also into productivity. And some research has shown that the cost of churn of losing an employee is about 150% of a higher level employee's wages to replace them and 75% of a lower level employee's wages to replace them. So there's where the SIB would come in. Y'all are all like doing, chick, chick, chick. I can see how I can make this work. You put in this policy, 
you reduce your churn by X percent, you're saving 150 percent here and 75 percent there, you can, you can make it work, right? You can totally make that work from a market perspective. Private sector firms could lead in this effort. Somebody could incentivize more private sector firms to do it. When more of them figure out that this actually makes sense, they do it voluntarily, and maybe the Chamber of Commerce could quit opposing any efforts by Congress to pass paid parental leave and paid sick leave requirements. So, I, I mean, no, in all seriousness, there is a piece where you could find, if you found a philanthropic foundation that would say to private firms, you'd take a certain scale and say, okay, um, if you implement these policies, we will pay for the cost of somebody else to take that role or whatever it happens to be. So we would pay some of the costs. So this would be cost neutral from your point of view to implement this policy. And we would like a return based on uh, whether you see the expected reductions in staff turnover and so on. So in other words, we will guarantee you this saves you, that this, this is cost neutral um, <clears throat> for you to implement this policy. And if we're wrong, Hey, it cost us money, and you implemented the policy for a while that was better, uh, and you found that it wasn't cost neutral, and it cost us some money. And if it's cost neutral or better, then actually you paid us some money, and there's something for you to reflect on. So you could make that kind of structure work. And, I, and the one I've always liked most in terms of this area is actually um, a sort of tax inspectors without borders model for getting um, better quality tax inspection into developing countries. Um, to paid for by the improved tax revenues. And that would be, um, initially, the easiest sell is around um, some of the corporates uh, who do a very good job of uh, running rings around the local tax um, regime's capacity. Um, but it also could be quite tasty when it came to the uh, upper echelons of society and their ability to pay tax in quite a lot of places as well. So I've always felt that a social impact bond on tax would be surprisingly fun. Um, in terms of some of the other elements, in terms of uh, the service user engagement and whether one can do that later, my personal view is that service user engagement needs to be built in right the way through the process. You need a starting point and then you need it as a fundamental part of the way that you do your service. And in fact, when you look at Peterborough, Jeanette's fundamental focus was on talking to offenders and finding out what was working for them what wasn't. But I don't think we have that embedded in as a policy, and I think we should do. In terms of welfare contexts, I, um, I, I think that there's enormous range, and I think that um, the use of impact bonds in emerging markets and developing countries around aid, which really is paternalistic. Um, hey, if you think service provision in some of the uh, in some of our countries is paternalistic. You should, you should look at some of, the, some of the aid, which does try, but it's very often pretty paternal. And that, again, the lack of adaptation in those models, so that creates a different reason for that, for that context. I think in a UK context, um, there is the need for realigning um, cost structures between government, local and national government, or different government departments. So the one that we have particular interest in at the moment is around mental health or, or, or um, health and employment, where obviously getting people, supporting people with mental health difficulties or other health difficulties back into work is both financially beneficial to government and massively beneficial to the individuals concerned in terms of their own well-being. But because those two departments, health and um, the Department for Work and Pensions, don't talk to each other very well, um, it has taken a long time to get some connective tissue in terms of building the pools of funding available for that. Does it all have to be on an outcomes basis at that point? No, not necessarily. Um, but quite often, one government department, due to um, trust issues, prefers to give money on an outcomes basis to another department rather than on an input basis. So again, that can be, it can be an, unlock, an unlocking mechanism. A reflection from you? Um, in terms of the participation, it has to be in the process. I'm totally in agreement with you. And my concern is that on the SIB designs I've seen, that hasn't been something that's specified. It's something that someone does, but it's not something that's considered one of the core elements. And, and this is where, when I'm looking back over um, the trends in, in public administration on how to reform public services, leaving out 
the client or the citizen all together is something that's a, a unique contribution of the SIB innovation so far, and one that I would prefer to see you jettison and figure out how to fill in, put that box in your flow chart and show us what it looks like. Um, because I think ongoing governance of the system and giving voice to those who are to be served is critical, and I don't think SIBs have been thinking about that enough at all. Um, in terms of welfare context, here's something again that um, Allison and I were struggling with as we were looking at early childhood SIBs around the OECD. And what we discovered is that SIBs don't exist in service areas that are considered universal social rights. They seem to exist in areas where there's some, a less of a universal commitment or where there's a lot of market players. And so this raised the concern for us of if SIBs might, we were actually asking the question, will SIBs expand social rights or contract them? And we're worried that if you bring a SIB into a context where you already have a universal social right, it actually might narrow the conception of social right rather than broadening it. And I'm not sure that narrowing conceptions of social rights will lead us to better social welfare, which again is a broad outcome that SIBs wish to achieve. So I think one needs to be extremely careful about the welfare context of what constitutes a social right or not. And then back to your point, Toby, about market making, you need to give very careful attention to the power of the government actor to regulate or manage the market in different places because that power is very different. Some of the people here are doing work on, on legal context. And you typically have an information asymmetry of a lot of expertise on how finance works among the financial investor and a lot of expertise on social service delivery among the service provider and not a lot of expertise uh, about social service here and the, and the investor or finance here. And so you can get some real problems in how you structure things because one side can, um, uh, can take advantage of those power asymmetries. And so I'm, I would be extremely concerned about that, which is why I'd really like to see a government architecture that really understood both those markets. I wish our public administration programs trained people in financial instruments because the, that world is moving in and we aren't adequately training our, the next generation of public servants to actually know how to understand, see those games and play onward sale of contracts as we've seen in PPPs. It'll be coming to SIBs real soon. So think about what that's gonna mean and try to understand that. Other questions? At the back. Hi. So it's uh, eight years since Peterborough was launched. Um, what do you think the SIBS market is going to look like eight years from now? Good or bad? Other question this side? You have, I, question? I have a question. I'm going to abuse my mic holding privileges. <laughs> um, Mildred, one of the things that you talked a lot about was democratic accountability um, and sort of the lack of that in the SIB model. And I'm curious, Toby, as to your reflections on that, um, do you think that there is democratic accountability with the SIBs in the UK? And if not, is it important? How can we see more of that? Any more questions? I'm tempted to throw in a very um, controversial question, and I'm going to do it. Uh, we are, they're agreeing too much. So can I challenge you again on these? Uh, maybe it's, it's related to this topic of democratic accountability. And I would like uh, both of you to reflect on the role of intermediaries. Uh, you go, sir. Intermediaries have played a fundamental role in uh, developing social income bonds. And uh, they are um, social enterprises or public sector players. And there is a risk that we are taking out uh, capacity from the public sector and we are expecting government to govern and regulate something they don't quite understand. So I wonder what do you see as the role of the intermediaries? Can 
uh, yesterday we had a question from the public that says, why don't we have public sector intermediaries so we have in-house this expertise and we maintain it? So that's my third question for the next round. Who's going first? Yeah. To you, you're the chair. The future the of uh, SIB, eight years until now? I'm not going to keep now? that one, you know that, do you? I'm going to do all, all of them. Okay, fine. All right. So Sorry. Oh, and then, all of them. Sorry. No, um, so future in a year's time. I, for me, this has to move from individual transaction to market. So uh, for, for me, this is about creating outcome-oriented markets. I'm actually less concerned about whether payment is on outcomes as on transparency of outcomes and incentives being used across the market, which means that success is determined by your effectiveness at delivering services for vulnerable people. Whether that is um, service user feedback or outcome payment or some other metric, I'm not sure I care. What I care about is much greater transparency in certain areas of public service delivery. And this is coming to the second element, which is democratic accountability. I think the reason that we're not looking at universal service rights social impact bonds is because they're not needed. You're not trying to create social impact bonds everywhere. You're trying to create them where there is failure. And where there is greatest failure is where you don't have a universal service and therefore not everyone cares about it. So, you know, if, the, if a, a government is really poor at schools, uh, and at prov a school provision, that's going to be a whole heap of issues and lots of people are going to care about it, and the same with health and so on. And so I don't think we need social impact bonds in direct core services in that way. We need them in places where there isn't the democratic accountability. Um, services for ex-offenders, drug users, uh, others. And that's actually why we have to be particularly, engage, particularly focused on that service user engagement. And I agree that I think it's a hole in a number of people's models. Um, but it's actually good where there is a failure of democratic accountability already. In terms of the role of intermediaries, I know you've got a problem with intermediaries, Mara. Um, I don't. I want to understand. Sorry, I want to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... In terms of your understanding, um, I think, I think my, my personal view is that you don't get the innovation without the intermediaries, but that as elements of this market, this becomes more standardised, or at least uh, the processes, the codification, the understanding, the need to focus on outcomes becomes more standardised, hopefully you'll have more and more public service actors that are able to take more and higher and higher proportion of the, of the job I'm a little bit nervous because there's been quite a lot of disintermediation in the UK. And what we've seen is less and less available support for the intermediation function. And therefore, actually, more danger of financialization because investors see an opportunity to take more of that role with still a relatively low capacity environment, low capacity government environment, because you're not dealing with government actors that have done five or six of these. Because when someone's done one, they go off and do something else. And someone else does the next one. Because that is the nature of public sector jobs in a lot of these circumstances. So um, the intermediaries, in my view, provide a public service um, and do so typically on a not-for-profit basis or certainly a high mission, mission basis. Um, and I think that there is an ongoing and interesting debate, and I'm having this very much in the developing world, of whether there is a role for intermediation between government and private sector actors when the government does not have the right capacities to do so. Uh, or whether that's actually, when you try and scale that, it just becomes the intermediary that's suddenly dastardly uh, and untrustworthy, and you just shift the problem upstream. I'm not quite sure I know. Obviously, social finance always is terribly, terribly careful. But that's my bias created by the fact that I sit at social finance. Thank you. Future of SIBs. Boy, it's hard to say. If you look, I think one way to think about the future of SIBs is to look at where we are presently with public-private partnerships in, fi in, in physical infrastructure and that that might be a, a blueprint for what we might expect SIBs to become. Um, we've heard at this conference that there's interest in standardization. And I think when we get that standardization, it will privilege finance. That's certainly what it's done in P3s non-compete clauses, um, secrecy, even though 75% of the contracts are verbatim from one project to another. They don't want transparency, and they make sure they don't get it. And I think that as the financial markets, if truly SIBs do have the outcome payment results that are 
that some of them anticipate, I think financial interest will could rise and would probably want to structure the market in a way that was um, more privileging to them. That's one view. Another view is that SIBs will die because they don't work and they don't deliver the kind of extraordinary payments that people are imagining and so there won't be new ones made and indeed you do see a slowdown. So it, it could go either way and I, I can't totally predict. In terms of accountability, um, I think this is a big concern because I think we're, we're substituting market accountability for democratic accountability and I think that is a problem. And um, the idea, I would agree, I mean your point that, that where, where there are universal rights, then SIBs aren't needed. So then the question becomes, should SIBs have, ha, have as a goal to get us to universal rights? Think about that. Because if that were your goal, that's an outcome. You probably can't monetize it, maybe you can if you want but it's more leaning, leaning back to the public values. So it, I'm asking you to think seriously about the public values foundation of what you're doing, and if your goal is to enhance social rights and build universalism, then that needs to be somehow put into the SIB architecture as the goal that you ultimately want to get to. I want to get to a world in the United States where every employer provides paid parental leave, right? And so what, how's my SIB going to help me get there? I want to get to a goal where in the United States, every state funds preschool 100% for all children. That's my goal. That's my outcome. Because universal access to things we have all agreed upon in, in society are necessary and important should be there. The role of intermediaries. Here's a problem. Um, if you think back to Enron and the uh, meltdown in California in electricity markets, one of the reasons why that happened is because the government, the, the civic core wasn't strong enough in that network system. And Enron was able to do some innovation that um, went beyond government's ability to understand the information asymmetries were very important. Um, and so there's a lot of argument going on in a lot of other sectors, not just social service sectors, that you must have the civic core. And that needs to be within public sector capacity. Um, and so outsourcing the management function, the oversight function, the coordination function to an actor who makes their living by doing that function, I think there's some problems with that. Um, and the multiple objectives that, that the public sector is supposed to hold dear, you need to make sure those are paid attention to by the intermediary. And so I think we're seeing the emergence, James Williams has been looking at this, the emergence of a whole market of intermediaries. Um, uh, Carolyn reported on them charging pretty hefty fees for boilerplate um, delivery. I think this, uh, this, is, this is, I think we need to be concerned about this and think about what's the public sector capacity. You disagree. Any question from the audience? Tom Farley, uh, thank you for the fascinating discussion points. Um, so a question for Toby. So you say one of the, the key advantages of the SIBs is that they can drive um, innovation and changes in areas where the public sector isn't engaging um, and hasn't gone interest in it at the time. Um, but if the outcomes are, a key part of it is that these outcomes are defined so stringently beforehand um, to make sure you achieve those outcomes. If the public sector already isn't engaging in those areas, why, how will the public sector, ma the uh, private sector manage to uh, work in these, these changes which aren't aligned with the original outcomes that the government's trying to achieve in the first place? Uh, Any other question before I pass it to Toby? <coughs> no, the question, do you have a question? No, the question is uh, at the back from Ed. <laughs> 
Thank you. Sorry, I was just wondering if I could ping Mildred's question on should SIBs have a goal to get to universal rights across to Toby? Okay. Very good. All right. So, um, let's just have a think about this. So, how can the private sector actors get the outcomes if the government can't? Was that the essential? If the government isn't trying to achieve those things in the first place, that's, those aren't their goals, hence they're not being achieved. How does the uh, private sector actor manage to achieve these goals which are in the original goals of the government? So, quite often, there might be a goal that the government does not regard as doable. So, um, the Ministry of Justice did not believe that its probation service, if working with short sentence offenders, would reduce their reoffending. So it didn't, it didn't like the reoffending being done by short sentence offenders, but it didn't believe in its own probation service to take on that role. Uh, and also because there are an awful lot of exits from short sentences, and therefore they'd have to expand the probation service significantly, and they weren't sure they wanted to do that. So the first starting point on this is that quite often one can agree an outcome that one would like that is desirable, but which is not being achieved um, under the present structure and system. And sometimes it is quite hard to get adaptation within the present system in order to do that. So the trouble then is that a lot of social organizations will say how marvelously and brilliantly they will be able to change their area, but their ability to capture data can be quite limited and therefore government's belief becomes quite cynical and therefore no one gets to engage with it. So what we basically did was try to provide a model which addressed some of these difficult issues in a more rigorous format. Um, and therefore that we managed to get the government actor to be willing to engage and to pay. We got service providers willing to engage, but then we put a wrapper around that in terms of, uh, of better uh, data capture and governance which focused on adaptation according to whether people were being effective. So that was the, that's, if you like, the model to be tested. And what we find is that that works quite often um, in terms of improving what's being done. Does one then, how does one universalize that? Does, does one have universalization as a goal? And I think that um, when we started social finance, we were a touch naive in many, many ways. Um, but one of the ways that we were a touch naive was we thought that if we produced a program which worked rigorously, and could evidence what it did, then it would spread like wildfire. And, and that would be marvelous. And what we discovered was that good news doesn't spread, but bad news does um, in, in, in government, generally speaking. Uh, and so the, the difficulty of getting something to spread is still really tricky. And, uh, you know, Peterborough was regarded as something which was terribly exciting, and so they did the changes to probation um, which uh, were very different. So I think how you universalize um, something is what we regard as very much as a work in progress. Um, we changed, you know, two or three years ago, really sort of the back end of Peterborough, when we saw that this universalization was far from happening. We've got much clearer that actually everything that we do needs a theory of change, but also a theory of scale. And we need to figure out how things scale um, and push and pull in order to make that happen. Um, and then I think the, the, the last um, bit around um, just coming back to this public sector intermediation, I think when you look at um, public-private partnerships, and I, I think some have been good and some have been mediocre, um, but what has seemed to be a requirement to make them work is a really strong treasury PPP team. Um, with a lot of, which has actually been kept culturally quite distinct, with a lot of people with real finance expertise engaged in it, and that has proved very successful in another number of countries. Uh, or at least that's what, who, that, that's what the people who are in them told me, so you can, you can judge that yourselves. Um, but, so I think there is a route to public sector intermediation, but there is then a need for, for sustaining it culturally separate. And I'd also say that the status quo in the public sector is terribly, terribly important. And you do need people with sharp elbows and a slightly obnoxious manner to keep pushing and pushing and pushing to make change happen. And I think that's the need for the external actors and an intermediary, i.e. one that can work between different actors.
in order to make change happen. Therefore, we'll always have a role if you want to see more rapid change. Thank you. Do you have comments on this question, or I'll ask you for a concluding remark? Okay. Accountability. We're talking about the most marginalized people in our societies. Marginalized by race, by class, by age, by health, by location. And we are designing systems to meet their needs better. That's very arrogant. And it's very brave and bold. And I would wish that we might become more humble and listen to the people we aim to serve and give them a voice in the system, which SIBs do not do. SIBs focus their market laser on government, inefficient, ineffective government as its primary target and market as the savior. When we have witnessed over the last decades, markets extract more and more from labor through flat and declining wages, tax rates that are higher on labor than they are on investment income or corporations. And I think that the notion that we might be able to use the power of markets to create social and economic well-being is a wonderful idea. And I would like to see SIBs retarget their attention toward the market itself. Because if you're really interested in getting at root causes, my theory of change would start with the erosion in wages and working conditions and housing that many, many, many people around the world have faced, which then yield social problems. So if we have a theory of change and a theory of scale that truly addresses root causes, then I think SIBs would cease their singular focus on government ineffectiveness and look more broadly at the entire system, including private market actors in their sites. What's good for the goose should be good for the gander. Thank you. Thank you. Toby, a concluding remark? I think, um, I think it's been very interesting and, and enjoyable. I think that a, a polarized debate around the value of the private sector is unhelpful. I think that the private sector uh, has strengths and weaknesses, but also each situation and circumstance is relatively unique. And that quite often um, there are pretty clear challenges to how things are happening at the moment, which you talk to any of the public servants working in them, they will be absolutely transparently clear to you as well, but be stuck in terms of how through the systems of accountability and structures they work in, how to make change happen. And therefore, the role of crystallizing that change from outside with a model that allows some sense of try before you buy um, has got a role to play in social change. Um, I entirely agree with Mildred that we have to be more thoughtful about the engagement of the most vulnerable in society in services that we generate for them. And I think that the only thing I would add is that at the moment, they have a really poor version of services, which is called assess and creep away. Because, oh, you're too complicated for me. So we met people who've had 48 assessments and no service. They're called hard to reach because of the verbal abuse they provide the next person to provide an assessment through the door. I think that's just a reasonable response to the service that they're getting. And so until we get more joined up services and more holistic services, and I suggest that is enabled through better use of data and through some sense of whether outcomes are happening or not. Now, I agree those feel like technocratic solutions designed by people who are highly educated. Um, and we need to marry that with a much, and I, think that, I hope that we are doing it, I hope that others are doing it, marry that with a more anthropological approach 
a more service user oriented approach and more um, you know, user based design type models. And I think that's possible. I have to say, I suppose the one area where Mildred and I have the greatest area of difference is our perception of what an investor is. I don't see them as having a horns and a tail. Uh, I think that they are, there's, there's often um, people who would also like to, are very interested in, in, um, in service improvement and transformation. And I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of second generation wealth and people much less sure whether they deserve it. Uh, and the rise in amount of money held by billionaires is depressingly high. And therefore, there is a community of actors, second generation wealth, who would like to do something positive with their money and aren't quite sure how to do that. I think we actually have to change the intermediation from that community away from some of the classical actors. And you're seeing some of the classical actors trying to change their behavior towards intermediating. So, you know, the private banks are becoming really interested in philanthropy. I think that's an interesting trend. Um, so I do think I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that there can be a socially motivated investment community to support um, a social change which brings, hopefully, in the ideal world, this technocratic solution that I think we're good at with the service user partnership and collaboration, which we need to improve upon. Um, the last point I would make is that I'm, I'm rather tempted by uh, Mildred's challenge to the private sector actors, in particularly, and this is not so much my experience, but where you do have particularly low rates of parental leave, for example, I think that's, that's a really interesting example of something where you could turn something onto the private sector and see whether that same model of here's a guarantee, here's a try before you buy, let's see if it works for you all on its own, is a really intriguing um, thing to think about uh, for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. This uh, concludes this uh, conference, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you for finding the time to come to the conference, contribute your ideas. You come from all over the world. And I think we enrich the debate and the listening between practitioners and academics to the conference. I want to thank uh, uh, partners in creating this, making this event possible, RAND, Piru at the London School of Hygiene and Medicine, colleagues from Newcastle University, and colleagues, of course, at the GoLab. And uh, I want to thank in particular a couple of colleagues at the GoLab because everything has run smoothly in, uh, to a greater extent. And uh, there is this elegant swan moving around, but there is a lot of paddling underneath. So I would like to thank uh, Andrea. <laughs> and I have some flowers for you. Come on up. I want everybody to see you. We have some flowers from you, Andrea, so you have to come all the way here. <laughs> and also, Elle Carter, who hates putting me foot on the spot, but she has been carrying the world on her shoulder in the past few days with Andrea. So thank you so much for gathering us and creating this interesting program for the conference. So the drinks are in the forum, yeah. So I'm sorry, I saw hands up for questions. So we are meeting in the forum for some drinks and you can ask your questions, maybe the one that you didn't want to have televised <laughs> uh, to our speaker who will be able to stay with us for a little while. Thank you.